this trend. Dramatic virus with so many fatalities and home losses. So it's something like 18,000 structures in 2018 from a single fire. The scary part is it's not the only community that's primed for it. Everyone you go to, you talk to people, and we're all amazed, comment to each other, this is, this is the worst one I've ever seen. And then you see those same people at the next fire you run into and you say, this is the worst one I've ever seen. And unfortunately, there's no real end in sight. This year, we expect to be the worst fire year ever. One thing I hope in the future is that firefighting agencies will uh, utilize this new technology that's been developed by the scientific community because we're building new tools, we have new observations, and we need to integrate that into fire management. Eventually, it'll keep happening again if we don't do something to break that chain, to make it harder or impossible for the fire to spread in such a destructive manner. Catastrophic wildfires are overwhelming California. Hugely destructive, these fires spread quickly over areas of woodland and brush, threatening communities and destroying property. In recent years, California has become the front line in the battle to develop new technology to prevent and fight wildland fires. The tools and the resources that we have in firefighting, they are all circa 19, hundreds, 1950s. The uh, innovation and, and advent of advanced technology that we're very used to here in Silicon Valley hasn't yet made its way into firefighting. People come all the time with ideas about, quite literally, bombing fires, dropping things, and suppression. And I back off and say, do you know that wildland firefighters don't usually know where the fire is? It's been described by as the holy grail of wildland firefighting. Where is the fire at this moment, and where are all the firefighters and the people evacuating? Having that kind of intelligence from satellites, from drones, and having that in the hands of the people who manage the incident, that's a huge first step. Mike Ralston, a former NASA rocket scientist, helped design this high-tech emergency response vehicle it's intended to be a mobile command center at a crisis event such as a wildland fire. So this vehicle is called the M-STAR, Mobile Special Technology and Aerial Response. Typically, we will carry um, one, two, three, four primary drones. You want to get on scene and get a drone in the air quickly. The next phase in like wildfire technology is integrating drone usage. Most likely, it's used to map fires because you can put cameras on these and you can put infrared cameras and you can fly in very complex terrain, smoky conditions. So that's a new tool that firefighters will be utilizing. Drone pilots go out, fly to do mapping. They come back with an SD card that has all the pictures they've taken. I put it in my, in my card reader. I'm using the software I have on here to go and stitch those things together, create an image, and maybe display that image outside to the commanders. Meanwhile, this vehicle actually is equipped with mini cameras. There's a camera on the front, the rear, and both sides, as well as on top of the mast. So I can see to maintain situational awareness of what's going on in the incident command post. But I can also, at the same time, see what the firefighters are doing on the inside of the fire. So this could be my firefighters on the inside, walking around. This image is from an augmented reality device that can transmit a live infrared feed from a firefighter's point of view. This is called a see-through mask. And the concept is that it takes a high-speed thermal camera, attaches it actually to the firefighter's uh, face piece, and then inside there's an optical uh, frame. It's kind of like a half of a pair of uh, eyeglasses. And inside this is projected outlines of what you see. If your vision is occluded by smoke, the thermal camera puts a green line around what you would be seeing. What that allows the firefighter to do is literally see through the smoke. We did some tests out here, and we found that they were able to four times faster find the victim. You know, every firefighter who tried it was like, wow, as soon as that thing's ready, I want one. Firefighting is not like what you see on TV. One, you can't see. Two, that smoke itself is driving you back. That's, that's what's uh, killing people, it's the smoke. 
At the Fire Physics Lab at the University of Maryland, Michael Golner and his students are studying the dangers of smoke inhalation. We're really focused on understanding the fire itself. And so there's a lot of ways that we tackle this. One is emissions. Place it into the quartz tube nice and gently. We look at different burning conditions and how that changes the emission. Different chemicals as well as particulate or the, the smoke, the dust particles, and how that affects firefighter health. We know that firefighters have had coughs and long-standing um, respiratory illnesses following some fires. What in the smoke causes long effects? Is it just the particles? Well, we can filter the particles. You can wear a certain mask. How do you design the best face masks or filters or other methods to keep those effluents that are causing harmful uh, effects from actually getting into people's lungs? The M-Star vehicle is also loaded with communications technology, connecting the whole firefighting team to keep them one step ahead of the fire. We're so used to going everywhere and having Wi-Fi signals. Well, you go to a fire, which may, have, uh, may be out in the boondock somewhere, may have impacted phone wires or your power cables might have, might have burned through. So bringing that, that type of infrastructure with you is critical. You can see we have satellite capability up here. We've got a 50-foot uh, mast that has antennas on top of it that allows us to paint an entire uh, Wi-Fi bubble around an incident. So if I can take from inside the fire, not only being able to have the firefighters see through the smoke, but have them take what they see and transmit it out to a screen out here, you wouldn't be able to transmit that image out to someone outside the area. So instead of me listening on the radio saying, did he say get out or did he say, you know, get me some coffee? I don't know what he said. But if I see in my screen, it's very, very unambiguous. And even if I'm in a stress situation where my brain's not operating that well, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm, I'm scared, what have you, it's very unambiguous. Hey, it's time to evacuate. Scientists are also employing technology to study wildland fires themselves, how they start and how they spread. In the United States, it's very apparent that there actually are more very large destructive wildfires. One term that's been is mega fires, fires that are over 100,000 acres in size. And these fires have been driving up the trends. Uh, th there's multiple reasons for that. One is the choices we've made in fire management in the United States. We've taken fires off the landscape, which means that now the fuel is built up and is gonna burn in the worst possible fire conditions when we can't control it. We've moved to where the fires always used to be in what we call the wildland urban interface. And finally, climate change. So in some areas, you see long-term droughts. You see changes in weather. California is a great example. The fire season used to be, you know, about six months. Now it's 365 days a year. One of the largest fires ever was in December. So this just, it, there's a new normal. Back at the fire physics lab, every aspect of a wildland fire is simulated and tested. By understanding the physics of fire, they hope to be able to predict it and control it. Something else that we study is actually in how fires spread. Embers are very small particles that fly in wildland fires. Uh, we're simulating them here with small wooden dowels. But in reality, it can be pieces of bark, it can be pieces of structures, and they get lofted into the plume. Those are actually responsible for most of the losses in a wildland fire. So we know the wood shake roofs are very bad. They're very easy to ignite. And those wood shakes break off and loft into embers and fly miles and miles down the street. So how does an ignition become a mega fire is very complex. If you have an ignition and it starts burning, if it's really windy, it's going to start burning and spreading rapidly, so you're getting lots of acreage burn quickly. If the fire gets into a canyon, it starts accelerating up that canyon. And if it gets so big by the time the aircraft and the firefighting crews get there, then it has the potential to burn even more. Fire whirls, uh, you know, this is a sort of exciting and incredibly terrifying phenomena where you know, fires will intensify. It almost looks like a tornado, and basically this vertical column of flame. And fire whirls uh, are, are found actually very often in wildland fires. They're usually very small. 
but on rare occasions, like the Car Fire in Northern California, they can become very large and very destructive and result in loss of life. So we study these because we're trying to understand their behavior, their formation, and their structures. Firewalls have been reported since, I think there was a giant earthquake in 1923 uh, in Japan outside of Tokyo. And that firewall was responsible for maybe up to 40,000 deaths. Now at certain scales, you might classify that as a fire tornado. And as you know, that's already going to be incredibly destructive. Add the fact that there's a whole bunch of fire inside, which is incinerating everything. They have a very tall flames, a very strong updraft. And as they go through, they fling stuff in the air, just like you think a tornado would. And then those light new fires. And so that's very dangerous. And I don't think we know all of the possible formation conditions. It's just extreme fire behavior. It's unpredictable. To get better at predicting wildland fire behavior, researchers need to collect the best raw data from an actual fire. To do this, some leave the lab behind to go face to face with an active blaze. Oh, man. That's pretty insane. That's how strong the winds are. But, you know, that's just the conditions. It's normal for this type of day. Today, Greg Clements and his students are visiting a controlled burn site to test their advanced fire scanning and mapping technology. This is a Doppler LiDAR here. That's the white box, which has a, a laser scanner. So we'll be able to scan all the way over to that mountainside. And our goal is to scan vertically through the plume as it starts building up. We're able to use that to peer into the smoke plume, and we can see where the strong updrafts and downdrafts are. And that's really critical to understand how the model is generating the heat, how it's putting it into the atmosphere, and propagating the fires. LiDAR can reveal details hidden at different layers in a plume of smoke, including density, speed, and circulation patterns. This information could be used to predict where air quality will be worst, where dangerous embers are likely to blow, and if extreme events such as fire tornadoes are likely to form. And then we also have a weather balloon system. And that's going to be tricky because filling the balloon with these kinds of winds is really hard. So if we understand what the winds are doing aloft and where the smoke layers are, the LIDAR provides that and weather balloons provide that information. Craig has taken his fire scanning tech to some of the biggest wildland fires, even venturing into the heart of the Camp Fire Inferno. It's quite intimidating to actually be on an active wildfire, especially in California. The fires are so fast. The first day is the big day. And so for us, we want to get there and collect the observations. So you still got air coming. Let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. By using tools such as LIDAR and weather balloons to measure the meteorological conditions inside the smoke, he hopes to be able to generate better computer models of wildfire spread. We can relay that information, and they can use that to better forecast when it's going to clear out. And so those are critical information that you don't think about. We can provide that. Despite all these advances, much about these destructive forces of nature is still unknown. I think there's a lot of room for technology to improve the way that we fight wildland fires and the way that we prepare for wildland fires. Fire management agencies should be utilizing the current state of the science and technology. It's the small changes that make a big difference. Then your firefighters have a chance. If you look at the number of firefighters in the United States 30 years ago, it was about a million firefighters across the United States. Today, 30 years later, it's about a million one, million two. Almost the same number of firefighters, but the number of fires, number of incidents, number of calls have gone, have gone up. So how do you get to the point of doing more with less or more with the same? And the answer, of course, is, is technology.